When you come to one of my workshops up here, there's a lot that I can cover. And it's hard to cover everything in one weekend. So oftentimes Chris and I will spend some time brainstorming what can we do to make things different? How can we get people to kind of enroll in several of the workshops? Realistically, we're here for three days and we pretty much work straight through that period of time. We used to be even more intense. It was like a, a boot camp and we'd go till almost 11 o'clock at night. And a lot of people said they can't do that anymore. So we refined the, the class more. But plein air painting is something that requires years and years and years of practice. Each one of these elements that I'm going to tell you about, or each key that I'm going to tell you about, is in itself a three-day class. So I have 12 things that, that uh, I feel are strong elements that you need to know. And if you were to put together a notebook, this would be the first page. It would be like an index page for your, for your book. So each one of these is a category. Each one of these categories, we could have a full three-day workshop. And I think Chris and I decided it'd be kind of cool to see if we can unravel some of these ideas. The first thing that you have to know about plein air painting the most important thing, and it's number one on the, our list of 12, is that you have to have a concept. A concept meaning an idea. A reason why you are painting to begin with. Now a lot of you, when you came to the workshop, we went out on location, and your concept was just get some paint on the canvas and make it look good. That's not a concept. That's like a goal. A concept is to sit in front of something like what we saw today, the barn and that view, and ask yourself, what would make a good painting? Most plein air painters fail in the first 10 minutes of their painting. And the reason why they fail is because they got too busy painting too early. The most important part of plein air painting is the moment before you start. And when Chris and I used to do a lot of uh, blogs and we wrote about this, she made a little drawing that I always remember and I wonder if I still have that drawing. But I said it's so crucial to do nothing the first 10 minutes. In fact, it's 10 minutes of your two hour spectrum, that's probably the most important that should be done compared to all the others. And that is to have a f real clear concept of what is it that you're actually trying to say. A real clear concept of what you're trying to say. So you need to look at the subject matter for a long period of time and ask yourself, so what about this painting or about this place that I want to render? And a lot of times with plainer painters, they'll go to a spot and they have no concept. They don't even have an idea, they're not inspired. It's kind of like when we went out and Carol was like, I want to paint a barn. And I go, well, how do you know? I just don't want to paint a barn. And I go, come on, let's try to do something that you've never done before. Let's paint a barn. So I sat her down and I relayed a concept. What about doing this? What about doing a barn in the field? And what about this? And put the lighting and put all that in. Once you settle down and look at something for a while, you go, wow, it really is kind of an interesting thing. John Singer Sargent, when he would go out on location, his main focus was to find a comfortable place to sit down. Huh. I mean, let's face it, if you're going to spend two hours being someplace, you want to be comfortable. When I design my workshops, there are certain things I take in consideration. One of them is, are my people that are taking the workshop, are they going to be comfortable? 
and a lot goes into that. There are a lot of places I would love to take you, but I know you would be very uncomfortable. Being alongside a busy road would be one of them. Some place where you couldn't get off, some place that you couldn't sit down, some place there wasn't a restroom, you know, or, or at least there is some kind of place that you could go somehow. So you've got to figure out you have to this. So he figured he could paint anything. He could make a concept out of anything. So he would go out into the meadow and they said that it was like clamshells opening up. He had all these umbrellas and things and he would just sit down in them and find a place that looked comfortable. You know, it could be a rock and some, some grass or something where he could lay out his stuff. And he wouldn't even look up. He'd just be looking at the ground. Where can I sit? And then he'd sit down and people who watched him said it was just like opening up circus tents. These umbrellas would open up and his chair would open up and he'd open up, his box would open all this stuff would open up and he'd have this instant studio. And once he had that all set up, he'd sit down and then look up. And whatever was in front of him, he figured he was good enough an artist to render it, to do a good job with it. So he sat there trying to develop a concept. He didn't look for a subject matter that, that would be a perfect painting. He'd make a perfect painting out of anything. It was up to him to make it work, not to stumble upon. And that's what a lot of people do when they go outdoors. They keep driving. We call it the Moses Syndrome. I learned that when I was in Hawaii. My, one of my first plein air experiences with my classes, we flew to Hawaii. I was 12 years old. My teacher goes, uh, how would you like to go to Hawaii? And I go, yeah, that'd be great. Mom's, mom and dad not there. I got to go travel with all these um, artists. They hated me because I got paint all over them. And we would go to the beach to start painting outdoors. It wasn't plein air painting because that term wasn't invented. So we painted outdoors. And we would drive to the beach. We'd get out of the car, we'd look. And we'd go, oh. The teacher would say, I wish those rocks were over there. So then we would get in the car and we would drive to the other end of the beach where the rocks were over there. But then there would be an island over here he didn't like. So then he'd go, well, let's go to the next beach because that island would be gone and something. So we would do that all day. We travel, and I don't know if you guys know, but Hawaii's an island. <laughs> and not a very big island. So we spent all day driving around the whole island to find the perfect spot, got nothing done. Which island are you in? Uh, Honolulu, the main. Um, Oahu, yeah. So we drove around the whole island. Didn't paint at all. So I learned from that your concept can be developed anywhere. Find a spot that's comfortable, look up, and then ask you a few questions. First question you would ask would be number two on your list, is what would be a center focal point? Number two on your list is number center focal point. We call it the CFP. It's so important to have a CFP in your paintings that it becomes second to the concept. And it's part of the concept. You can't create a concept without a central focal point. What is it that you're going to paint? The central focal point is usually the brightest, lightest thing because we don't paint things, we paint effects. Choosing that is in your realm of possibility. And just like with the concept, you don't leave that up to the gods. You choose a focal point. So in the barns today that we saw, we saw a lot of people painting central focal points and they were all different. Yet all of you were in the same place. Some of you chose the side of the wall, some of you chose the roof, some of you chose behind the barn. Those are all choices, but you've got to choose a central focal point. It is your choice. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter, but choose it. And then let the viewer know you chose that. So when somebody says, what's your central focal point? You can point to it and say, this is my central focal point. It's this. 
And again, it's an effect. It's usually a lighting effect on something. Those are the best. But it could be a color. Have a white, if you all of a sudden had a snow scene and you put a fire truck in there and it's red, you can't help but see that. That's an effect. Is it a good one? I'd prefer a fire truck in a snow scene with a light on it. So if you had a highlight on the fire truck, that highlight on the fire truck would be even more interesting than the fire truck. That's why I think that the lighting is so much more important. Hmm? So after you get a central focal point and decide that's what I want, then you have to consider composition. And you guys are so lucky today because that's what we're going to review. <laughs> How are you going to compose what's in front of you and work around your central focal point to develop your concept. You see how this is all working? So you don't go out there looking for a composition. You have to go out there and have an idea. That idea, sit and look at your, your, what you're going to paint for a while. Look at it and go, what's a good idea? I know my central focal point should be an effect of light. Maybe I should find something that I can put light on. What would that be? Once you choose that, then you figure, how can I compose around that to make that work? Vanishing points? It's not on my list. Not on your list. Well, it is, but the vanishing points are not. Vanishing points are, are part of a concept that's not discussed right now, but it is part of the, part of the 12. Okay. Don't want to go ahead of us. So how you compose things, and we're going to take apart composition a bit. And again, a lot of instructors will teach you composition. I will teach you things about composition that a lot of instructors haven't even thought about. The next thing is values. The lightness and darkness of a painting has everything to do with helping you get your central focal point to work, putting together your composition. Values are really valuable in a painting, to use that term in a, in a sentence. Then another, the next thing you need to, uh, to, to evaluate and look over is number five, color. The colors you choose, how are you going to create with color to emphasize your central focal point? So there again too, if we have a winter scene and we stick in a fire truck, fire truck's red, how is that going to affect the overall composition? obviously in those extremes, huge. But oftentimes you'll look at a meadow and it's all in greens and painting everything in green might not be effective to the overall central focal point. You may have to choose different colors, different ways of handling your greens, your reds, your blues. So color is important. But surprising in my realm of, of teaching I find that color is one of the least important elements in painting. And a lot of people who come to my classes go, oh, if I could only mix color. And I go, color is so not important. How do I know it's not important? Ansel Adams did extraordinary things in black and white. And never once do you ever look at one of his photographs and say, God, I wish it had color. In fact, if anything, if you think of an Ansel Adams and he did do it in color, you'd wonder whether or not it would be an Ansel Adams. So if Ansel Adams could create what he did without color, then color must not be very important. Unfortunately, there are a lot of colorists out there that would scream at that thought because they don't have anything else to, to play with. So if they're not throwing purple on something, they don't know what to do with it. 
There are a lot of plein air courses where they'll go, oh, just paint all your shadows in purple and paint the background in pink. Well, yeah, that's good if you like purple and pink. But we're kind of of the school of painting what you see. It's surprising when you paint what you see, like the old masters did, the Hudson River School artists. The world is predominantly variations of gray. So color isn't quite as important as, as it would be for some of the other things. Number six on our list of 12, brush strokes. Ninety percent of the people who take my workshops want to loosen up. Ninety percent of my students that are in my classes want to loosen up. They want to paint with better brush strokes. In fact, that's really quite common when you have um, all of the ones above taken care of. Pretty much the next thing is, is like, well, how can I paint that with interesting brush strokes? Brush strokes are very important to the overall effect. And as we already discussed at the beginning of this class, a lot of those brush strokes are byproducts of the painting being created. So that's one way of thinking about it. But brush strokes are very, very important into the overall effect of painting. Excuse me? Yeah. At one point you said something about Horizontal brush strokes create one thing and vertical another. Yeah. Well, well, there, those are things. Those. That's a different conversation. We didn't talk about that today. But in my classes. Okay. Yeah. But see, like brush strokes can be. If you even understand the meaning of brush strokes, which a lot of instructors don't. If you go crossways with a brush stroke, it reflects light better than if you go vertical. And so if you want to put things into shadow, you put it in shadow doing horizontal strokes. If you want to create real strong highlights on objects by taking a brush stroke and going across the surface actually gives the effect of something being illuminated. So just the angles of vertical and horizontal, not to mention the diagonals, and then the kind of brush strokes and all this, all that stuff, that's a whole nother discussion, a whole nother class. You'll have to come to the next workshop for that. <laughs> hmm? Yeah. Oh, I could come to Phoenix. Well, Sedona? You can. Yeah, of course. Yeah, we painted there on location a lot. But I kind of like having my classes come to me. <laughs> um, so, uh, brush strokes. Uh, number seven in our list are edges. And I know that we discussed that a little bit today. How edges are used in a painting. And like I said, in that conversation, we could have an entire workshop. Edges are crucial. In fact, if you don't have your edges correct, your paintings will fall apart. But a lot of instructors don't know what edges to soften and what to harden. These are things that all need to be learned and trained. And everything, everything you put into a painting requires this kind of focus and attention. You wonder why plein air painting is so difficult. Literally every one of these things that I'm talking about happens with every brush stroke. Every brush stroke you put down, you have to consider the edge. You have to consider the brush stroke. You have to consider the color, the value, how it plays into the composition, whether or not it affects the central focal point, and whether or not it is in line with your concept. Can you see how difficult that is? Every brush stroke you do has that responsibility. And people wonder why they can't just go outdoors and paint. Really great plein air painting is intentional. It's practiced. 
It's practice like playing the piano. It's as serious as a heart attack. Plainer painters, they look like they're having fun. They are working. They're making as many decisions as somebody would filling in taxes for somebody else. Trying not to make a mistake, trying not to make a mistake, trying not to make a mistake. I can guarantee you most really good planar painters that are worth anything sit there with their toes curled, their butt cheeks tightened, and their teeth grinding because there's too many things that can go wrong. And look, we've already talked about seven, seven things that could go wrong on each stroke. But wait, there's five more. <laughs> Next thing that's important in plein air painting and to be aware of are transitions. In nature, every centimeter, every meter, every inch, every 10 inches, every 15 inches, every mile goes into transition. There shouldn't be one square inch on your painting that isn't going either into light or into dark. There should be not one inch of your canvas that isn't going from cool or into warm, or warm into cool. The transitions in a painting are crucial to give the effect of being there, to reproducing nature. And I think Carmen said something about she has a hard time painting landscapes. Can you see why? Because in that space, you have to worry about transitions, whether or not your light is getting lighter to darker, darker to lighter, cooler to warmer, warmer to cooler. What is a cool color? What's a warm color? What's a dark color? What's a light color? Every square inch of that canvas has to be going one way or the other. And oh, not to mention, Number nine, very important key, drawing. Your drawing has to be good. You can fake a lot. In fact, a lot of the stuff that you do in here, you can fake a lot. If you did a painting that had a good concept, center, focal point, composition, value, color, brush strokes, edges, transitions, maybe your drawing doesn't have to be that good. And I know that's a scary thing for a lot of artists. Because they're not that good at drawing. But if you're not good at drawing, go see my new YouTube video that I just popped up on using a prospect or a proportional divider. There's a tool out there for that. You know, like for your phones, there's an app for that. There's actually a tool out there for, for uh, drawing that helps you out. So it's, uh, no, we don't use grids. You'll have to see my proportional divider uh, video on YouTube. So you can see that tonight. I put it, it, got, it went up this morning. But drawing is crucial. In fact, painting is drawing with color. In fact, when you watch my uh, video on using uh, the proportional divider, you actually will learn that Drawing isn't what you think it is. Painting is actually more what drawing is than, than drawing what you think is. is. Sounds like a Rumsfeld thing. <laughs> you don't know what you don't know that you don't know. But if you knew, you'd realize that drawing... <laughs> I'm sorry. I should let you swallow before I talk. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, drawing is the end point of two spaces uh, that illustrate proportion. So when you think about a ball, right, and we're going to draw a round circle, what you're not really doing is drawing a circle. You're actually telling the world where that ball ends. So the proportion, that space in there, is the mass that you're trying to identify off of everything else. Where that mass ends is where the line goes. So when you're painting, you're usually filling in that mass. 
and the line actually creates itself where the masses touch each other. So if you're going to do a vase, you fill in the vase and then you fill in the background. Where those two come together, it creates its own line. But when you're drawing, you put that line in there. But painting, you literally are filling in mass to push it up to the end where a line would go. So actually painting is drawing, drawing is painting, the same thing. Number 10, perspective. Perspective. So you were talking about vanishing points. In the conversation of perspective, we find vanishing points, knowing where your vanishing points and things are in a painting. Equally important, if you have a painting that has out of perspective, your husbands will be very angry. They'll say, something's wrong with the perspective. I can't tell you how many of my students go home with a really nice painting and they go, my husband didn't like it because the perspective is off. Because they can't see, you know, what women feel. They can't see that the, the, the colors and the space and, and you know, is, is what, they look at the linear, the possibility it has to be perfect. And in essence, surprisingly, perspective is sometimes best when it's off. So if you put a, a house into your, your painting and you do it perfect in perspective, oftentimes that perspective will overshadow the overall painting. And so oftentimes having the, the perspective off a little or edges blurred so that you don't pay attention to the perspective creates a better effect. We don't want to put our attention on painting things. When you're painting perspective, you're really concentrating on the thing itself. And the best thing you could do is not to be so intense. So perspective is way down on my list of things that are really important. That's good to know. That's good to know. And so next time your husband says your perspective off, you say, well, it's not that important. Who cares? Who cares? <laughs> well, the, there is, is a time, there's a time when you have to worry about it. Um, the next thing that's, that's important, and again, every one of these things is going to be an upcoming workshop. Every one of these things can be a conversation just like what we're talking about here today. Next thing, and it has to do a lot with perspective, is the horizon line. Where your horizon line is in a painting is as important as anything else in that space. In fact, without knowing where the horizon line is in a painting, you can't get your perspective. You also have a hard time having the viewer understand their perspective and their relationship to the painting in very complicated scenes, like if I'm doing uh, Yellowstone Falls and I'm halfway in the canyon, I'm looking up at things and down at things. Where my eye level line is in that space is crucial. Because if my eye level line's up here and I'm looking down into the canyon, I'm literally seeing the tops of all the rocks. But as those rocks go up the canyon, I'm starting to see them even with my eye and as they go high, they actually like building. I'll be seeing the sides of them. And I can't tell you how many times I look at paintings and you're looking at tops of rocks here and tops of rocks here and the whole painting looks like you're, you're floating out there. So knowing your relationship to your subject matter is really crucial. So the eye level is the key to that? Your eye level line is the key to that. Oh, remember? Yeah, remember what I did to you? I said, so where's your horizon line? And then once we figured that out, you went, oh, wow. This is how you me. That's what I did to her, too. So what I did, if you want to figure out where your, where your, your horizon line is, is that you see here we're looking down on this. And looking this, we're looking up at that. So what you want to do is you want to bring this down to the point that you neither can see the top or the bottom. That you can only see this point. So when you get it down to that point, you can pretty much take that line 
and look at it and find out where it is out in the, in the view there. And you notice that too with you the, today. The horizon line played a huge difference in your, your drawing. So you can't see the top and you can't see the... Yeah, you can't see the... If you, if you hold this up at a certain way, you can't see the top nor the bottom. And that will tell you where your line is. Then it's perfectly straight. And then you can take that line and look at it where it falls into your building or rocks or whatever you're doing out there. And you will see that uh, what's actually lying on your perspective. So your horizon line is very important um, in relationship to your overall composition. And that should be number 11. And number 12, developing your memory skills. Because I guarantee you, anything that you start out there will require memory skills. There is no way that you're going to paint a plein air painting that's successful at all without using memory. If you're, re if you're going to paint something and you're, you're literally just painting as it goes over two hours, your painting's going to fail. There's no way that you can paint a plein air painting without forcing yourself to remember what, was, what once was. Memory exercises are crucial. So those are my 12 keys, my 12 elements for putting together a masterful painting. Any questions?